Barnes & Noble Union Square, please give a warm welcome to New York Times best-selling author, producer, and television presenter, Richard Osman, and BNN Portover Podcast, Jenna Siri. Well, hello, everyone. I knew what seat I had to sit in because one microphone was significantly higher than the other one. Yes. I love they hide you over there just before you come on. And I'm the only author where actually you can see me above that stack. <laughs> yes, usually we were at a, a little bit more discreet as yeah. we walk up. But, but I think if you looked over today, you'd see. But thank you all so much for being here for our live poured over taping. I'm Jenna Siri, the associate producer and co-host. And today, as you heard, I am joined by Richard Osman, who is many things, but most importantly today, our author of We Solve Murders. Thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. When you say your co-host, is there another host who's not with us? Yes. Who's that? It is my incredible and lovely and talented boss, Miwa Messer. Your boss? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Who's best, though, out of, out of you and her? Um, well, you know what? Let's get started. Yeah. We all know we've got the A-team this evening. We know that. So I'm sure many of you are here as fans of Thursday Murder Club and the, success the following books, but we're here to talk about a brand new set of characters, a brand new mystery, and a brand new series that's going to introduce us all to some very interesting people. So I wonder if you could just start, because I'm sure there's many of you who have not yet read the book, just set up the story a little bit for us. Of course, we will talk about Thursday Murder Club as well, don't worry, don't panic. <laughs> um, yeah, so the Thursday Murder Club also, by the way, is coming back. So I've, I've started there. Uh, yeah. It'll be seven or eight years, um, and you're... Uh, so, yeah, they're coming back. No, I wanted, uh, after the first four Thursday Murder Clubs, if anyone's read the first four, I felt they worked as a, a quartet. I also felt that they needed a year off after the, the end of the last one. Uh, and I wanted to write a new world. What I really wanted to do is write something that was a bit more globetrotting. The one thing about Thursday Murder Club is you can't really make Joyce jump out of a helicopter. Well. I'm listening. It's, it's tempting. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know. With her hips, I don't know. So I thought I'd like to write something a bit more globetrotting. And as all, I, I always start everything I ever do with character. That's the, the only thing I'm really interested in. So I thought, well, who would it be fun to send around the world? You know, who would I like to write about being sent around the world? And I thought, well, I'm going to have someone who really, 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 really doesn't want to go around the world. <laughs> He's the main character of this book is Steve Wheeler, who is a retired cop who lives in the New Forest in England. It's in Hampshire, if you're ever in England. It's very beautiful. And all he wants to do, he's a widower, he's got, his life gets smaller and smaller, and he's sort of comfortable with that. He loves his pub quiz every Wednesday. He loves his cat called Trouble, who's on the, uh, the front cover there, sitting on a gun. Um, you know cats. Uh, and essentially, that's his life. So I think, well, how do I get Steve to go around the world? And I had the idea of having a father-in-law, daughter-in-law detective duo. I think father and daughter, you sort of, there's an assumed relationship there. And I thought father-in-law and daughter-in-law, you don't actually have to be friends. And I thought a father-in-law and daughter-in-law who actually love each other. Steve, as I say, is a widower. Amy, who is his daughter-in-law, was brought up in care. And there's, they have a bond. They lean on each other. They would never, ever, ever admit they love each other. But they do very much. And she's a bodyguard for, for billionaires, Amy. And I thought, well, if Amy is in trouble, who's she going to send for? She's going to send for Steve. So poor Steve gets this message from Amy saying, you have to come over to this private island on a private jet immediately. And he is absolutely furious about it. <laughs> uh, so it's those two, and it was supposed to be a detective duo, Steve and Amy, so that's the book I was writing. And then when I start writing, I, was, I try and have my characters talk to each other. That's how I start you know, working out who they are. And I thought, well, when we first meet Amy, she's got to be looking after somebody. She's a bodyguard, so who's she looking after? So I came up with this idea of a character called Rosie D'Antonio, who's sort of like Jackie Collins, really. She's, she's the world's best-selling novelist, if you don't count Lee Child. Uh, and so I came up with, with Rosie, and I've got Amy talking to her, and they're having a chat. And Rosie, I think she's sitting on a, on a, on a swan in a swimming pool. Not on a swan, you know, like a blow-up swan. And 
by the end of that scene, I was so in love with Rosie, I thought it's not a detective duo anymore, it's a detective trio. And so actually it's the three of them, Steve, the retired cop, Amy, the, uh, the bodyguard, and Rosie D'Antonio, the age-fluid author, uh, who, were, who essentially are sort of uh, try and outrun a hitman and try and catch another one. I am very interested to hear that maybe Steve was sort of the first piece of this puzzle because I'm having a hard time imagining that Rosie ever was not the the mm. prime voice there, just the way she takes over the story. But I love what you said about these stories really being about the characters for you because so often I think mysteries and procedurals can be so plot-based. They're really here to tell that story versus the characters there are just sort of pieces to move that along. But with all yeah. of your books, I think many people would say those characters are the most important part. Well, I think so. I think if you, if you and I love crime fiction, I've always read it, but I think because, because of the contract we have as crime fiction readers and writers, which is, look, here's an improbable situation, here's an impossible thing to work out, and by the end, we know we're going to find a solution. So we all understand that. And I think if you have that format, then you can do anything within it. And my thought is always, I, I just want to write about the world as I see it. I want to write about characters we want to spend time with. I want to have fun. You know, I want to have laughter. I want to have tears. And, and crime fiction, I think, allows you to do that. Plot, to me is sort of secondary. If you think back to the last 50 crime books you read, and I said to you, what was the plot? You probably wouldn't be able to tell me the plot of many of them, where if I said, how did that book make you feel, or who was a favorite character in that book, you'd be able to tell me. You know, because plot is, I mean, there's a million plots out there. Someone got murdered, someone did it. You know, uh, and we find out who it is, and occasionally, like, and then there were none, is a, is a plot that you think, wow. That's incredible. That book is worth reading for the plot. But there aren't many books worth reading for the plot, whereas there are loads of books that are worth reading for the heart or the story they tell you or the characters you, you meet. And so, yeah, I, I always, for me, crime fiction is just a lovely vehicle that I can stuff full of stuff that makes me laugh. I love that. And I do have many questions from the audience, and I don't think you'll be surprised that many of the things that y'all were asking were the things I wanted to know as well. And many of us were all wondering if you could talk a little bit about your inspiration for characters and sort of how you go about shaping them because they are all so wonderfully distinct and different and fun and even when they're people that we maybe shouldn't like I think we're always on board with whatever they have to say. If I have a strength as a writer it's that I'm very very easily bored and so I write short chapters because I like to finish a chapter in a day I'm goal oriented in that way and then, so the next day I've got to start a new chapter and I never really think about what it's going to be until I sit down. And quite often I just go, oh, who could walk in now? And then I start thinking about someone and someone walks in and I'm like, oh, he's a bit boring. And then he'll say something and go, oh no, okay, that's a bit more interesting. And then a character will reveal themselves to me, if you know what I mean. The thing with, uh, with, with villains especially is quite often, sometimes in books, a villain will be sort of so awful and just all bad. And my, my thought is always, Serial killers, if you're a serial killer, say, any in? <laughs> you never know in New York, do you? There might be a couple of hands go up. Hands go up and it's not the hand of the person who's there. Um, I always think with serial killers, most days when they wake up, they're not going, right, I'm going to kill somebody today, I think. Who should I kill? Most days they wake up and go, oh, God, I've got to go to the dentist. Oh, that's so annoying. Or, oh, the cat needs their vaccination. So if whoever I'm writing, if they're good or bad, I try to remember that they're not just the first thing we think they might be, that there's something behind it. And it's, there's, there's a character in We Solve Murders. This would be an example of how, how, how I like to uh, do characters. So poor Steve Wheeler has to leave the New Forest and come over to South Carolina, in fact. Um, and he's on a private jet. He's not happy about it. Now, I've always thought, whenever I come to America, I love coming to America. It's my absolute favorite place in the world. I just, I adore it. I've always adored it since I was a kid. The one thing I don't like about coming to America is border patrol, <laughs> right? Because it's terrifying. Especially if you're English. If you're, if you're English, all you want to do all the time is joke, right? It's all you want to do. And there's the one situation every English person knows that you mustn't joke in. And it's not a funeral. It is when you're at the border in America. And you've queued up for four hours at JFK. You've got like 30 or 40 jokes in your head. But when that person says, what's the purpose of your business in this country, sir? You just go, oh, I'm just going to see you for a holiday. <laughs> Thank you for letting me in. Uh, so I've, 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 always thought, I've always thought they are interesting characters because they're terrifying, but 
they, they go home and do something interesting, I'm guessing. So anyway, I, I know Steve is flying into America. So I think, right, Steve, I'm going to set you a challenge and see how you get out of this. You've got to fly into America. You have got to get some information from a Border Patrol officer. And you've got to do it by joking with him. And so I start, <laughs> imagine, I mean, can you imagine? Uh, and so I think, great, that's the challenge I set myself. And then I just let Steve take over and do what he does. And so this, I've got this um, Border Patrol officer called Carlos Moss, who's like, he's got the aviator shades. He's like six foot four. He is not taking any of Steve's shit at any point. He's not interested. Uh, and then bit by bit, Steve sort of maybe gets the information he needs out of Carlos. And that's how I come up with characters, really. I don't think of the character and then put them in something. I think of a situation, think who might be in that, and at the end of a scene, go, oh, wow, I like you. And then Carlos Moss, funnily enough, becomes a slightly bigger part of the story and will certainly be coming back for the next one. If he doesn't die, you never know. Perhaps he dies in this book. You never know. It was a death by humor, death by jokes. Yes. He was not prepared. I really like the way you write those propulsion. It sounds like it's something that you is part of your craft as well, these short chapters, and constantly sort of changing perspectives. You're moving scenes. You're moving us through. We don't stay one place for very long no. in any of your books, and I think that that's a great way to sort of create that propulsion in mystery, but it also sometimes I'm like, wait, that, that's it? I think I needed a little bit more, which is a very, uh, it, it hurts a little bit as a reader, but you know it's there for the right reason. And they come back. They'll be, they'll, they'll be there in seven chapters' time, and those <laughs> chapters will only take you 15 minutes to read. Sometimes they come back. So, yeah, and, and sometimes they die. Aww. That's a good name for a book, isn't it? <laughs> and sometimes they die. Oh, I'm going to see. And when people say where do writers get their ideas from, that's where they get their ideas from. Right. I, I love that. I mean, I think there's a lot of a lot of people are also wondering. You know, do you get a lot of inspiration in your life? I hope maybe not too much for some of these things, but also, you know, especially when you're writing about writers or you're writing about, you know, the local guy down the pub. There, are, mm. there's possibility to get those inspirations from all around you. Yeah, I don't think so. I never really... Pe people are always determined to, that, that the Thursday Murder Club are based on real people, that Joyce is my mum and things like that. And they're not really... They're, at, at first, of course, you pick up something someone will say or, or, or like, a, like an archetype. But you spend any time in their company, you spend a couple of days writing them, and they, they, bec they so become their own person. So, I mean, Rosie is... At the beginning, I was thinking, what if she's looking after, like a Jackie Collins type? So you go, okay, that's, that's my first bit of my framework for Rosie D'Antonio. But then as soon as she starts talking about other things, she becomes not like Jackie Collins, she becomes like Rosie D'Antonio. And so, yeah, occasionally things are like jumping off points, but hopefully by the time you've finished a book, someone should be a, an entirely well-rounded and unrecognizable character, which is not to say when I go and see my mum, she doesn't say things, and I go, I am going to write that down, <laughs> and Joyce is going to say that in the next book. Yes, we have to have those little moments that yeah. slip through. But I, I am intrigued always reading characters like Rosie, who are these huge, over-the-top, you know, larger-than-life people, and say the craziest things. And I imagine there's got to be a degree of backstory that we'll just never get to know. But I, I'm intrigued to see where she goes and what we, what we learn from her, because there's a lot there. Well, I, you know, having done four Thursday murder clubs, the one thing I've learned is you can hint at something in book one, and then in book three you go, oh, yeah, I hinted that in book one, so now I can do something with it. So there's lots of things I don't do something with, but I do set myself little, you know, challenges in the books ahead. There's three or four things in this book that I know I'll have to go into more in the, in, in, in the next uh, We Solve Murders. So yeah, I try, I try and set myself little, uh, just little challenges to keep, keep myself entertained. That's, honestly, that's the only thing I do when I write, is try and entertain myself. Because I think if I'm being entertained, then readers will be entertained. And if I don't know who the murderer is yet, then readers won't know who the murderer is yet. That's... Uh, <laughs> That's always been my technique. It seems to have worked so far. But and when I, people say, you know what, I knew, I knew on page seven who the killer was, I go, well, I didn't, so... <laughs> do you write everything in order as you go through, or do you jump back and forth? I pretty much write everything in order, yeah. And, and yeah, the story kind of tells itself to me. Occasionally, a couple of the books, I've, I knew I had a sort of a denouement at the end, so I, I, I wrote that. But now, yeah, I, I try and right in order and, and be surprised by people. I mean, the key thing is you then go back and make it good. You know, the thing I've learned is you just get the first draft done as quickly as you can. No one's ever going to see it. You never send it to anyone, never send it to your publishers or anything. Just get it done and then go back and pretend you're a writer. That's the key. It is always interesting when I'm talking to people who write these sort of novels that usually have a sort of structure. A mystery novel usually has 
a sort of structure. And I'm always curious to know when you find out how it's going to end. Because I've talked to some authors who are like, yep, I, I know before I even touch the keyboard exactly everything that's going to happen. But it sounds like you might have a little bit more play in what you're doing. I just think that must be so boring. <laughs> but don't you think? You just must be kind of... You, just, you know it all already, so you're just filling in the gaps all the way through. No, I like it. I, usually I've got a direction of travel, so I think I know, I know roughly where I want to be. So in We Solve Murders, I knew there was a story I'd read about influencers um, being used to smuggle things. And I just thought, oh, that's, a, that's an interesting world. So I thought, oh, there's, there's something in that. And I knew roughly, I knew I wanted to finish in Dubai. That was pretty much the only note I had for myself, is make sure you finish it, because, you know, just make sure everyone converges on Dubai at some point, because anything can happen there. But uh, apart from that, I didn't really know anything. I just I sort of carried on through. I knew I wanted, at some point I wanted to go to the Caribbean or the Caribbean. Uh, <laughs> Caribbean is the correct way to pronounce it. Um, so I knew I wanted that. And, but then I just, you know, characters come in and things go in unusual, you know, places. And I, I would be bored if I knew tomorrow I had to write this and the day after I had to write that. It would, it would, it would not entertain me. But step one, influencers. Step two, Dubai. Step three, cat, question mark. Yeah, there's definitely a cat in there. Uh, and again, the cat was just so Steve, Steve is, um, as I say, wants to be at home. And I, I, I just thought a cat is such a lovely visual interpretation of wanting to be at home, of wanting to get back to something, of, of something needing you. And on the, uh, the front cover, the cat is even looking up as if to say, Steve, where are you? You said you were only going to go for two days. Yeah. And it's like a week and a half later. And Margaret from next door hasn't fed me today. Oh. Uh, and so, I, he, 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 so the cat just it equals home. Because someone's house is someone's house. Who cares? But a cat says, no, I, I do have to get back. Poor trouble. Poor trouble, he's called, yeah. <laughs> That's because every time I walk past a dog or a cat in the street, I always say, hello, trouble. And, and I always have done so. I thought I'd call it Cat Trouble. And I got a lot of fun with uh, the name Trouble as well. Like, there's about eight or nine different uses of it in the, in yes. the book. Too many if... if uh... God, you can tell you're in New York, can't you? Yes. The dulcet tones of the city are Blimey. welcoming you. It's nice. I feel like I'm in London. Whoa. Yes, it's, it's so pleasant. I love getting to read over the top characters. Is it fun to get to write over the top characters? I think I think if you're writing a if you're writing a novel, that, then you have to write a story. There's there's be a reason you're writing it. It can't just be someone got up in the morning and watched TV and then went to bed. So you're writing an extraordinary thing, and it's helpful if you have in your quiver a couple of extraordinary characters. But with the Thursday Murder Club, I just know, because I've got four main characters, whatever situation I put them in, so I'll start a scene and I'll know something's going to happen, I don't know what, but I know that one of them will have the solution. I know that three of them will have an incorrect solution that will make me laugh, and then one of them in the end will have a solution. Uh, and in this book, when you've got someone like Rosie, firstly, she's got that lovely thing of she's incredibly rich. She's got 80s money, Rosie. And so if you are flying around the world, it's quite useful to have someone who... who has a private jet. It just means that there's a lot of plot nonsense you don't have to work out. If someone could just go, oh yes, we'll use my private jet. You think, thank you, Rosie. Carbon That's emissions, a... we don't know her. That's, we're not Listen, worrying about that. Like Rosie cares. <laughs> That's lovely, but also, yeah, I try and write about the real world and then I try and put characters in there that will make me laugh when they relate to the real world. And someone like Rosie, any situation you put her in, it's going to make me laugh. Steve is funny because he does not want to be there at all. Rosie is funny because she just wants to have a martini. Uh, and Amy is funny because she's like, you do know that someone's trying to kill me uh, and you don't want to be here and you just want to drink. Can we please concentrate on who's trying to kill me? And so I know that the kind of, the ridiculousness of it is taken care of. And then the job is to put a plot right through the middle of that and make it real and make you care. And Hank is funny because he's Dutch. Hank, there is a Dutch character in there, and yeah, by there is something. I used to work with a lot of Dutch people at Endemol, and there is something intrinsically amusing about <laughs> Dutch people. There is, but I think I think they know it as well. So they are they they are very very serious, but I th they must know it's funny. Uh, and so Hank, all the way through, I think I think I think has a a rough idea that he's quite amusing, but he he would never admit to it. But he does like milk. And I think... Yeah, well, he likes milk. And again, this is... <laughs> do you look at people from, from real life? When I was at Endemol, and John Demol, he used to run Endemol, and you'd go over to uh, Hilversum, where, where Endemol was based, and it's the biggest 
television company in the world. It's worth $6 billion, this company. And you'd go to John's office, uh, and he would just go, uh, hi, guys, milk? <laughs> and you're like, oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. I'll, have a, I'll have a milk. And so, yeah, I've always, I've, I've always been looking for a place for that. And, yeah, Hink, all, all Hink does is drink milk. But what's that about? If you went to a meeting of someone, and they said, would you like some milk? <laughs> I would leave. He had his own, John DeMolt not only had his own private jet, he had his own, like, Boeing 747. And he got that because he, because he wasn't allowed to smoke on a normal plane. So okay. he bought his own 747. How about that? Well, I mean, we all have dreams. We all, we, have, we all have dreams, and his are about smoking and milk. <laughs> mm, what good breath. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> <laughs> love your tapestry of characters. You, in all of your works, have not only wonderful main characters that we're following, but these side characters that show up and really offer us these little glimpses of, of something else, of yeah. humor, of seriousness, of, you know, when it's the villain, they're a little bit, there's something there. I personally have to say in We Solve Murders, my favorite of these characters is Felicity because she was Aww. just kind of like a warm hug the whole yeah. time. And I love getting this glimpse into this wider picture and watching everyone come together. And especially in We Solve Murders, there are some great scenes where we kind of get the whole gang together. And those are so fun to read. There are. There, there's, um, Steve does have his lunchtime gang in his village uh, in the New Forest. And I had to be careful, actually, because once they were together, uh, it was like writing the Thursday Murder Club again, because they were all, <laughs> the, like the four of them were just really, really making me laugh. Uh, and the one we spend most time with is a guy called Tony Taylor, who is the mechanic in the village who spends almost every bit of his dialogue is telling you the directions from one place to another place <laughs> in like real detail. Of all the people who go to the pub, he's, he's the one who's not on the pub quiz team. He's not the sharpest tool in the box, uh, Tony, so he's lovely to write. But I just think you, you do need to have other characters in books. You read any book and suddenly a cipher will come in and give you some information that's needed for the plot. And I never, ever, ever like to have a cipher. If someone comes in, I think you're going to have to earn your right to be on this page. And so anytime anyone comes in, I just think, well, who could you be? My wife is an actor, and sometimes you'll get pages through, and you go, well, I don't know, this character isn't anything. This character is just, you know, a baker. And I always think if an actor got even the smallest role in this book, and they look through the scene, would they go, oh, that's lovely. I would really, really like to do that part. And so I, I always try and think that, which is every, everyone's got to uh, earn the right to be there. And they do. And I think we've talked a lot about characters, but like you said, that is really the heart of this mm -hmm. book. And since you do go into so many different perspectives, some of us were wondering, do you have a character that is the most fun to write and someone that gave you the most trouble? Funnily enough, when I first started Thursday Murder Club, so that would have been, I mean, it came out in 2020. It took about three years, so probably about 2017. Uh, and like anyone here who's just starting writing a novel or, or thinking about writing a novel, the first thing I thought was, it's, I felt so fraudulent to even begin writing. You know, you sit there and you think, oh, what, well, how does, a, how does a novel begin? How would a novelist write? Okay, well, it's probably someone should be walking down the street and, oh, oh they describe the sky, don't they, at the start of a novel. They would go, John walked down the street in a green anorak and the sky was blue, or maybe it was grey. And I thought, I can't write, I can't tell people what colour the sky is. And then I suddenly thought, do you know what? I've got, had this character, Joyce. I thought, why doesn't Joyce write a diary? And then Joyce started writing the story for me, because Joyce could write. I, I felt like I was fraudulent writing, whereas Joyce, whose brain patterns are exactly the same as mine, which is minor thing, trivial thing, important thing, another trivial thing, another trivial thing, what's on television, what am I having for my tea, a clue to a murder, trivial thing. <laughs> so that's her brain, and I just I was able to sit down and write this, and Joyce would, would sort of come alive. And then I thought, OK, I'm, a, I'm not writing a book. These characters are writing a book for me, and that got me over that obstacle of who am I to write a book. And from that moment on, Joyce is the one, if ever I'm stuck, I'll sit down, I'll just write the word Joyce at the top of a piece of paper, and just, you know, it's all stream of consciousness uh, with Joyce. And she's like, the, the beauty of having a character who does that is she can tell you what's just happened, if it was slightly complicated, tell you what she's about to have tit for tea, and then tell you what's about to happen as well. She's like an incredible sort of, she can tie a knot in a plot so easily, Joyce, uh, and she's making you laugh at the same time. And so often, she gives little clues to things, but you don't realize they're clues because you think she's talking about, you know, the washing up or about her microwave. So she, she, for me, is the most fun to write because she's the most like the inside of my head, I would say. 
And if anyone's difficult to write, I just stop writing them. <laughs> because I think, well, if I'm, I mean, I, I, obviously I'm not channeling them. So if someone's not fun to write, they just, uh, yeah, I, I get rid of them. Chances are they're not really serving what you need them to serve if, yeah, if exactly. you aren't excited to get in their head. Exactly. I like writing the baddies. I like writing the goodies. I like writing, a, if a postman turns up, I'm going to think, oh, what sort of postman are you? I, I just, I, I need to enjoy it otherwise. And if I, if I enjoy it, hopefully readers enjoy it. Yes, from cab driver to uh, private jet steward, you've got them all, they're good. Exactly. I try, I try to, certainly. And going into a little bit of plot, some people were wondering if, about how you sort of structure. It sounds like a lot of it is, you know, as you go, you're sort of crafting and moving. When you're working with things like a plot twist or a, you know, a big set piece, are you ever moving those around as you go or do you find that they find their homes pretty easily? Can I just say for the people listening on the podcast, I'm now opening the world's smallest bottle of water. <laughs> even, even for a normal-sized person, that's a, that's a small bottle of water. Imagine if this was a litre bottle, I'm just my hands are that yes. big. We're doing some, some mm. tricks of scale up yeah. here for everyone. Um, now I forgot the question. No, a plot. Uh, yeah. Yes, that little structure thing. Things. Yeah, I, it's interesting. Obviously, you know, I've, I've done five novels now, and more importantly, I've read a thousand novels, and that's the key... So, you know, I know roughly, I'm very, very, very vibes-based, if that makes sense. I sort of feel my way through a plot. I feel, you know, where I am. My wonderful editor, Pam, who's out in the audience somewhere, if, if she ever writes a note on a manuscript, it's always brackets bored, uh, <laughs> which is the best note you can possibly get because it, it says, actually, you always look and you go, oh, yeah, because I shouldn't have put that scene there. And actually, yeah, that character, he's just said something very similar before. And so it's always a great note to get. I haven't sort of moved everything around like chess pieces. I just I feel it all the time. And I feel, do we need something that's funny now? We need a bit of tension now. I need to speed this plot up a little bit now. I need to stop introducing so many characters now. I need some ballast here. And it's just that feeling, if, if you're in control of what it is that you're writing, you just kind of feel it and... The key is, again, going back and changing it. So you get to the end of a book, you read it back through, and that's when you work out sometimes. You think, oh, of course, I was too close to that scene, and it's, it's slightly getting in the way of everything. Uh, and so, yeah, the answer is I'm vibes-based, and that's really unhelpful to anybody. But I think you can just feel your way through a story. And if you've read, read, read your whole life, then you know how a story makes you feel, and that's how you want your readers to feel. And so it's just that thing of what haven't I done for 20 pages? Perhaps I should do that now. Right, we all know what we're looking for in a good mystery. Yeah. We know what we like, and it may not all be the same thing. I mean, there are many kinds of mysteries, but I think when we, when we turn up and we're looking for that, that propulsivity, those voices, that's what we find when we're, when we're like, how do, I, how do I not be bored here? Yeah, propulsivity, which is not a word I've ever heard or said before. It is might be something I made up. It is, it is, it's good, though. Uh, I, I really, it was like diving off a high board, even beginning that word. But I think I got to the end of it. Uh, propulsivity, I think, is, is the absolute key. You have to constantly be, you know, that's what people mean when they say, you know, you want people to, to turn to the next page. And it is that thing, and it can be, you know, you can, be, you can have propulsion through action, you can have propulsion through emotion, you can have propulsion through jokes, you can have propulsion through cliffhangers. You know, it's, there's, there's lots of different ways of doing it, and you must always try and mix those different ways up as well. Otherwise, it, propulsivity can become relentlessness very quickly unless you, sort of, you, you start to mix and match. But it's absolutely that thing of what's the next trick to get people reading the next chapter. Is that why you write mystery novels, to create that? I mean, you know, you can, you can write anything, you can move on, but now you've got two series of mystery mm. novels. Is that what brings you to the genre? I write, I write them because I read them, really, is the truth. They're my favourite thing to read, and so I was always, that's always what I was going to write. But, yeah, there is also a thing, you know, my television career was in formats and in game shows and, in, and having something that's got a beginning, a middle, and an end, and setting up a question at the beginning of a show that you answer at the end of the show. It's something I, I love have being contained like that. I like being in that box because I'm just aware that if you if someone sits down and they feel comfortable by which I mean they know the world in which they are and they know sort of where they're heading actually you can do anything whereas if you don't have that world people can really after about 40 pages they go sorry where's this going whereas with a crime novel you kind of go listen I'm sure he knows what he's doing I know we're, we're heading somewhere or other, which is like a format. You just go, you can go anywhere because you know at the end someone's going to win or someone's going to lose or you're going to give away the car. You know, you know where you're headed. And so I think weirdly those restrictions give you a huge amount of freedom. But mainly I write them because 
I read them. And that's, you, you can't write without understanding everything that's gone before in that genre, without understanding the history of the thing, without understanding what is a trope, what isn't a trope, what is a trope you can play with, what's a new trope, without just understanding the, the history of the thing. And you, you can have an enormous amount of fun playing about with it. I think that's something that you hear with these novels is like, is this too formulaic? You know, the, with genre fiction, especially mystery, there is a real formula. There is a real, you know, we expect certain things, we expect certain beats, but it's all about finding those ways to upend what we expect or to lean into something. I mean, there are plenty of moments where I'm like, yeah, this is exactly what I thought was going to happen. And that's good because I needed yeah. that right now. I think exactly. I mean, it's like there's only so many chords in music, aren't there? But, uh, you know, there's still lots of new tunes. Honestly, that's the fun of being a writer. If every single time you sat down and you had to completely reinvent the history of literature uh, and what it meant to tell a story, then you probably couldn't do a book a year, I'm thinking. <laughs> Whereas if you get to stand on the shoulders of giants, uh, then it's, you know, you, you're, you're sort of, you're aware, you know, I'm very, very aware that all I'm doing is adding to a pile of books that I've loved. And the idea that maybe I might be added to someone else's pile of books that they love is a, is a wonderful thing. I'm not trying to, you know, create some brand new genre. I'm trying to say, please let me be part of this gang. Please let these stories be part of, you know, the, the world of, of, of crime fiction. And, you know, the fact that some of them are and they get on lists and things, that's, a, that's the absolute dream. But it, it's, you know, crime fiction will be going on for hundreds of years to come. And I'm, I'm just very grateful that I get to do one a year at the moment. So is that part of what brought you to writing a new series and starting a new series is wanting to expand on that? And how does it feel to go from, you know, writing this four books all in a row of this one group of people and doing their one, you know, their thing and now starting a new thing? Yeah, it's great. I, listen, I had to do something new because, again, my career has always been you do something new and you always do it a year before people ask you to. That's the key. You must always, you know, I knew after a fifth one, people would go, why don't you do something new? So I thought I'll do it, I'll do it after the fourth one because I knew already, I knew that I wanted to do something new and I knew that I wanted to, vibes exactly. I knew I wanted, there's other stuff I wanted to do and other stuff I wanted to write. And, you know, when you do a TV show and you change the rules, people lose their minds for about six months and then they're okay with it. And then if you change those rules, they lose their minds about that. And so it's that thing of you have to introduce people slowly to new people, then new characters. And I just, I just, I, I, I'm going to be doing this for the next 30 years, I hope. And I'm, for various reasons to do with the age of my main characters, I probably can't do that with the Thursday Murder Club. <laughs> so I had to introduce some slightly younger people to the, uh, just, you know, for natural wastage, you understand. I don't think we want to think about that just no. yet. I'm, they're not going to get killed anytime soon. Okay. And also, the Thursday Murder Club books are so um, concertinaed in time. I think the first four take place within about a year. If you've ever watched the John Wick films, they're like that. The, the, <laughs> the second one starts the minute the, the first one ends. Perfect. So Thursday Murder Club is very John, Whisk, John Wick-esque. We can, get all, we can get like eight books done in a week. Yeah, basically. exactly, exactly that. I love that. I wonder, too, if you could talk a little bit about some of your favorite mystery novels some of your favorite types of mysteries for us i like what is it's interesting because i always try and write i write very specifically about the, the the day i'm living at the moment so i write very specifically in uh, we sold medicine about 2024 so you know and that's what i like because you know i love looking back at um dorothy or sayers or you know christy or uh, josephine tay someone like that and of course they're writing a murder mystery and as you know we can't remember the plots of any of them but we really understand when I find out what people have for breakfast and I find out where people go to work um, there's a Dorothy Osayas novel called Murder Must Advertise and it's set in an advertising agency uh, and she's writing very specifically about what it was like to work in an advertising agency in that year at that time and where they went for lunch and but it reads like the best social history I absolutely love reading that sort of thing and so that's what I try and do as well. And, you know, in 100 years' time, you can read it and go, oh, that was what it was like to live in 2024, give or take. So I love all of those um, British ones from the 20s and 30s. You know, American crime I love Harlan Coburn uh, because he just... Harlan does something which I don't do, which is all those twists and turns all the time. And, you know, you kind of think, I knew you were going to do a twist and turn. I still didn't see it, Harlan. How did you manage that? And he's another member of the Tall Authors Club, uh, which is good. There's a reason, I think, that crime fiction is uh, amongst the most popular fiction in the world, and it is that thing of, there is that, the lightest touch of a formula underneath it, 
which means we're comfortable reading it, but it means that an author, a good author, can go anywhere with it and tell any story and, and visit any part of the world with it. That is, it seems to be why we all keep coming back and that, you know, no matter what, the people who love mysteries love mysteries. I think even when I worked in the stores, I never found quite a more devoted fan base than someone who loves a specific mystery series. I know, and when people, you know, it's like, um, you know, Lee Child having 24 Reacher novels. If you read the first one and like it, then you just think, well, this is great, because I've got years of sort of wonderful, you know, you have to lighten it with other things in between occasionally, but you've know, got years of, 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 of this stuff. And, you know, as a writer, I'd love it if I had 24 novels under my belt, but I, unfortunately you have to wait 24 years to do that, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best. But, yeah, you, you do. It's like, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise, because when we watch a TV show that we like, we want to see the second series of that TV show, and then we want to see the third series, or season, sorry, uh, of, that, uh, of that show. And so it, it, it's the same thing, other than, you know, books, books take a slightly longer to write. But as a TV person, TV is always, it's a second series business, a third series business, a fourth series business. And so I've, I've always been someone, if you get like Paula Hawkins who did The Girl on the Train, it was a huge global success, but she's then got to follow it up with a completely different story. I think that would be, that's my, my worst nightmare. At least with Thursday Murder Club, I already had the characters. So I, I could send them straight back out to war. Uh, so it was, you know, I could, do, I could do four in four years. So that's, I, I will always write series because I love reading them, as I think most readers do, uh, and it's, it's, it's fun to write. I've been reading Elizabeth George's books since oh, wow. I was, like, yeah. old enough to, mostly old enough to read them. And yeah. I think, and I'll still, you know, we'll still pick up anything that she writes. Exactly. It's like, you know, The Talented Mr. Ripley, I think, is, is probably the best novel of all time. But then the four follow-ups are all also amazing, because you just think, well, I, I just want to see what Tom does next. I just, I just, you know, he's the most awful man in the world, but I hope he gets away with it. It's just, you know, if you've got a character you love, you just, you, you just want to keep... I'm reading the new... Um, John le Carre's son has just done a new Smiley novel, and it is brilliant. It's so good, and I love Smiley. I absolutely love Smiley, and the idea of someone else writing like John le Carre seems an impossibility. But Nick Harkaway, his son, absolutely does it. And you just think, oh, maybe we've got another 30 years of George Smiley ahead of us as well. It's, if you just love the characters, and, and it is. That's why plot is the least important thing. It's character, character, character. People you want to spend time with. It really makes it easy to sort of fall into these books and to find a place among them. I think anyone who's read Thursday Murder Club, you, everyone's, or when you pick up We Solve Murders, you have like that character or that piece where you're like, no matter what happens, that's my favorite part. And that is such an, a yeah. welcoming and exciting thing to come back to. I know, and that's why everyone's going to lose their mind if the film isn't good. Well, but, you know, that's sometimes that's what we always say here at Barnes & Noble and other places. The book is always going to be better. Well, that's it. I mean, with, with the film, which, which um, that they've been filming this summer, I, right from the beginning I said I'm not going to get involved at some because I've done my version of The Thursday Murder Club, and that's the book. And if you want to know my head and my heart, it's, I, I did it. I wrote it down. It's there. Those are my characters. Those are the stories that I wanted to tell. So it's, it's there. And someone else now wants to tell that story, which is brilliant. And the director is amazing. And the cast are incredible. Uh, and so, but I'm like everyone else, which is I'm just going to sit back and see what that's like. But I wouldn't have done the screenplay or anything like that because yeah, I've, I've, I've done my version of that story already. And it's, it's, it's up to somebody else to do their version. It's always best to sort of look at adaptations as a separate entity entirely, I think, especially when it's something that you love so much and have put so much of yourself into. Exactly. And listen, Chris Columbus is an incredible director, so you're in safe hands. The cast is so extraordinary. Uh, you know, people have been shouting Helen Mirren at me in the street for years. Uh, and, you know, finally she's in it. It's, it's funny. So, 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 the, the, so Helen Mirren is Elizabeth in the film. Uh, and so Ben Kingsley is Ibrahim. And they, both of those would be. Uh, and Celia Emery, who you might not know so much over here in America, but she's Joyce and she is incredible. I mean, she couldn't be more perfect. And then there's Pierce Brosnan as Ron, which is the one where people are going, Pierce Brosnan as Ron. And he, by the way, we've been on set a few times, he is the most handsome man I have ever met <laughs> in my life. He's incredible. But people are going, really? Pierce Brosnan as Ron? And I said, here's the thing about Pierce Brosnan as Ron. Pierce Brosnan is who Ron would have chosen to play Ron. <laughs> yes. So he's perfect. 
yes. They all they all encapsulate it very well. In the, I, uh, in, in, in the next book, the fifth book, I, get, I started a scene with Ibrahim and Ron. Literally, you just you walk in and them having a conversation. The conversation they're having is, who's the best ever James Bond? Uh, and Ron says, Pierce Brosnan. I'm, wow. I'm delighted to say. I, I told th- Pierce Brosnan that he was so happy. Yes. I think even without... Pierce being involved, that still would have been Ron's answer. Yes. I wonder, too, to sort of round us out and to really give this the life that it needs, is there anything that really surprised you as you stepped away from Thursday and into We Solve Murders that really was like, oh, this is a very different experience? It's interesting that because because you know I I felt I was writing the same book is the truth because it's you know it comes from the same brain I worked out very early on that all these characters existed in the same world so where Steve lives which is the New Forest it's probably about an hour and a half from Cooper's Chase I would say Tony Taylor would know for sure he'd tell you exactly which uh, which, which which route to take so it all exists in the same world and you know I say oh look at but it's more globe trotting and this that the other but the reason it's globe trotting is. It's funny to me to take the very English sensibilities that I try and write and put it on a, a bigger global scale. It's just, I just find it funny to do that. It just amuses me to, to be in Dubai and in St. Lucia, but still be writing in the same way. So for me, it's lovely to write new characters and be inside their heads. But the way I write, I'm not trying to write a different type of book. I'm not trying to write something hard-boiled. I'm not trying to write a, a sort of Dan Brown novel. I'm, try, I'm just trying to write the stuff that always entertains me and makes me laugh. But we're on helicopters instead of, you know, in a little Vauxhall Nova. It feels like the experience to me was very, very similar, just, just with a group of new friends. I love that. And I think everyone here will enjoy their time with our new friends in We Solve Murders. So, Richard, thank you so much for joining oh, us today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.